We turn now to consider a very important tool in any fabrication process, which is the building of thin films. The most common way of making thin films is to simply thermally evaporate, for example. So one might take a uh, boat that is often made of a resistive material through which a very large current can be passed, heating it up until it's incandescent. And then in a vacuum, uh, metal atoms will simply sublime from the metal in the boat, so that if a target is placed someplace over here, it will get coated with metal atoms. Typically, one might have behind the target a heater to control the temperature of the target, and we'll see why that's important in a moment. One may have a shutter here to control the time exposure. And then typically somewhere close by over here, a thickness monitor, which is a quartz crystal whose frequency changes as metal atoms deposit on it. So the question is, if I want to put a thin film on a surface and keep it clean, what sort of a vacuum do I need? This slide shows here a result from the kinetic theory of gases. Basically, we have just equated the x, y, and z components of the velocity of a gas molecule with a half kT, in other words, a half m x squared thermal average um, with one half kT. And the net result of doing that is this result here for the RMS uh, value of speed of a molecule in centimeters per second. Where T is the absolute temperature of the gas source. From this, one can derive the number of molecules per second hitting a surface. So if you take a particular direction, such as the x direction, and realize that for a random distribution, half of them will be going in the plus x direction and half in the minus x direction, knowing the average volume and the uh, density of, uh, or the number, average number of particles per unit volume, one can then calculate the rate at which they hit a surface. Uh, in this equation here, rho is the density of the gas, uh, but we can replace it with the pressure using the ideal gas law. If we say that rho is the number of particles divided by the volume, then this is equal to P divided by KT. This uh, number can be worked out, and in the uh, book we do it for um, the mass of oxygen, which has an atomic mass of 32. And by substituting into this equation, we find that at a pressure of 10 to the minus 6 torr, so that's inserting P in place of rho in this equation, we get 10 to the 15 oxygen molecules hitting a square centimeter per second. Now, this is an important number. If we take a look at how many that translates to, so we have the square root of 10 to the 15 hitting a box of side one centimeter, this is approximately uh, three angstroms per molecule if they're spaced evenly. And since that's about the size of the molecule, a coverage of 10 to the 15 per square centimeter is approximately a monolayer. So what have we learned? A monolayer of material can be uh, deposited at a pressure of 10 to the minus 6 torr. This is quite a high vacuum. It's not the sort of vacuum that ultra-high uh, vacuum surface scientists use, but it's a good kind of vacuum to get with an oil pump and a bell jar. And you can see that even in a vacuum like this, one monolayer per second is being deposited on the surface. So in order to get uh, thin films cleanly deposited on surfaces, one has to work at very much higher vacuums and remove the films that will have been on the sample surface when you put it into the vacuum chamber in the first place. Now I mentioned sample heating. The two variables that you can control in a typical vacuum sample chamber
are the rate at which material is evaporated onto the surface, and the temperature of the surface, which controls the rate at which atoms and molecules diffuse around on the surface. Then, depending on the interactions between the atoms and molecules, so we can control the rate of arrival, we can control the diffusion rate on the surface, and then the attraction between molecules and the surface are two parameters that depend on the chemistry of the situation. Depending on all of those parameters and the size of an aggregate of atoms required to form a critical nucleus for crystal growth, there are three common methods of, or three common habits of growth on surfaces. This first Frank van der Merwe assumes that atoms just build up in perfect monolayers one on top of the other. It's actually highly unlikely. Uh, stransky krastanov growth uh, assumes that after a while, once the surface is covered, if there's a strong interaction between these molecules and the surface, after a while one would begin to nucleate growth uh, upwards like this. And uh, Volmer-Weber is one in which the interactions between the uh, atoms or molecules dominates and therefore they nucleate and grow upwards from the surface before covering the surface in the first place. And in practice, the actual growth mode is some combination of all of these. And one of the objects of surface science is to find the right combination for getting ep epitaxial growth. Very frequently, material is put down using um, chemical uh, reactions. Chemical vapor deposition uh, is an example of this. So, for example, silane gas, SiH4, can react with a hot surface to decompose leave silicon on the surface and hydrogen to escape. I mentioned to you um, thermal evaporation of material onto surfaces. There are other ways of doing this. For example, the target to be evaporated uh, can be removed by bombarding it with energetic ions, that sputtering. Another way to do this is to hit the target with an electron beam. It's a very good way of getting uniform films. So this is an image of a modern UHV thin film deposition system, and you can see how enormously complicated it is. I'll let you look at the details of this uh, system in the book. But let me just end by telling you about molecular beam epitaxy. Molecular beam epitaxy is really nothing more than controlled thin film deposition from heated targets onto a heated substrate it's simply controlled, though, um, so that the growth rate on the surface uh, with care can be such that the deposited atoms really form an atomically uniform layer on the surface. Now, this is difficult to do. I mentioned the parameters before that can control the growth of uh, add layers on surfaces. In general, atomic layers put onto surfaces will not grow in registry with the underlying crystal lattice because the lattice parameters will be different. The atoms will be smaller or bigger in the surface or the add layer. For this reason, then, there are techniques developed to grow strained add layers uh, on top of which a certain number of additional layers can be placed and it's possible then sometimes to grow a reasonable number of well-ordered add layers on the surface. Here is an example of a device I showed in chapter one, where mercury telluride was grown interleaved with layers of mercury cadmium telluride. The scale bar here is 100 nanometers, so this super lattice structure contains layers of around about 10 nanometers. And by alternating high quality crystalline layers of material, one can grow new types of material. And we'll talk about this in chapter nine when we discuss nanostructuring by, by layering of materials.